Hi everybody and welcome to today's live Q&A session. My name is Marcy Melzer and I am from wavesofcommunication.com. I am an intuitive speech and language pathologist consultant and I help parents use language facilitation to teach their late talking children how to use the words they need, the language they have inside of them to share all of their wisdom with the world. And I do that in my Waves of Communication parent coaching programs and I do it on my YouTube channel and my Waves of Communication Facebook page and uh, here on these Thursday 2 p.m. Q&A sessions right here on my Waves of Communication page, you are welcome to join me every week to ask questions about your language facilitation journey. So this Q&A will be great for you if you are in my programs, if you have taken my independent study course, if you are working with me in one of my, if you did a starter program and you're looking for some follow-up guidance, or if you are just checking out my YouTube channel and watching a bunch of videos and trying some language facilitation strategies at home and if you're doing all of that and you're seeing some progress I'd be super happy to hear from you if you are looking at my videos and learning some strategies and you um, are struggling and you aren't sure if you're doing it right or you want to get some guidance about that go ahead and describe your situation and put it in the comments of this video let's say you, this is the first time you've seen me and you don't even even know if language facilitation can potentially help your child tell me a little bit about your child in the comments section so you can let me know your child's age and tell me what's going on what level of language are they are they at needs based language are they not talking at all are they using echolalia what kind of language is your child using you'll want to tell me that and you know their age and what kind of language they're using and then if you're not sure why your child's not talking Put in your question or comment here on this video, um, a comment about why you think your child's not talking because frankly, you have a lot of knowledge. You have way more knowledge about your child certainly than I do. And if you wanna get some guidance from me about the kinds of strategies or the things that you need to be doing to help your child overcome what I call communication blockages. What happens a lot with kids is that they have every potential and capability to talk, but there are things going on in their environment that are actually blocking them from learning natural language, especially after they get healthy. So, um, and, then, and then, yeah, if you have any questions about any of that, go ahead and put them in the comments of this video now. While we're getting started and I'm waiting for some video to come in, I see there's some people joining me. Hi Nadine and Adriana, she has a question for me, and there's Monica who's in my program, and Grace. Thank you for joining me today, ladies. I know that there will be more people coming and jumping on, and I did get a video, uh, or did get a question, excuse me from Adriana a little earlier today so I'm gonna get started and talk about that Adriana has been following my videos for a while and um, yeah I'm just waiting for you to potentially join my program but it looks like she's digging in and using she's really smart and joining me every week and asking me questions on this Q&A so um, Let's see what she wants to know. She says, hi Marcy, I need some tips on how to help my little girl to play interactive with her peers at school. That's what I have in the school report, but I'm not at school with her to help her. So playing interactive with peers anywhere, question mark. Oops, excuse me, itchy nose. Um, so Adriana's potentially, I guess, looking for some strategies to how to help her child. And it's common that parents, you know, are doing language facilities facilitation at home and then you get reports from school and they tell you that their your child maybe is either talking more at school or less at school than they are at home and it all depends on what's going on at school to potentially cause um, you know either a nicer situation or a less fun situation than you're doing at home and the thing is about school there's very little you have that's going to be able to control what they do at school and the good 
good thing about language facilitation is that when kids actually start to get better at using their own natural language, other people respond to them better, including peers and adults, kids and adults. So once kids go from, they hit the next level of progress and they start to talk a little bit more, this issue of making friends becomes easier for them. But that's not the question. The question is, what can she do to help facilitate it? So. Like she said, she's not at school to be able to help her little girl learn how to make friends with other kids. So my suggestion and what I usually suggest to the parents who are in my program is that you try to provide opportunities for your child to do some interactive play with your assistants. So just like you wouldn't expect your child to go and talk in front of strangers and say words, you know, without being shy or whoever they are, um, you you wouldn't throw them into situations around in your house that that you wouldn't be there to support. So my first suggestion is to try to set up opportunities for you to have a, a, a way to sort of facilitate through a social interaction. And if you don't have any um, siblings, a lot of times it's, it happens with kids who don't have siblings because siblings learn how to wait for each other and share things and take turns a little bit sooner than kids who um, are at school, you know, it, only children who start to go to school. So if you don't have any siblings around, um, you can do these strategies with siblings or you can do these strategies with neighbors or other kids from class. And what I usually, usually suggest as an idea to provide um, a cool opportunity is to um, ask a mom, a, maybe a mom in the class that your child's in or a friend, maybe even one that you don't see very often because your lives are very busy, um, if you can have her, that, that person, drop off their child at your house while they go run an errand, like do a gro their grocery shopping. So look for a peer that you potentially could could invite over for a very short play date. It's not going to be like two and a half hours long where you're doing all kinds of eating together, napping and all that kind of stuff, like a babysitting sort of, sort of situation. Just enough time to let your child have some exposure to a friend that they're not really used to hanging out with all the time while maybe that child's mom's not there. So it, it's, you know, every mom would love the opportunity to potentially give up their child for one shopping trip so that their child can go help another child. And it doesn't matter if that child's late talking or not. Just so long as you just have two kiddos in your house for a period of time, an hour and a half to two hours maybe at the most, enough time for somebody to go do your grocery shopping and, and come back and pick her up. And in this period of time, while you're having a play date at your house, you'll work through potential issues. You know, offer opportunities for the kids to play, have some free play time together where they have to share the toys that your daughter has in their playroom. Maybe let them watch a video together or, you know, do something like that where they are engaging in the same activity and they have to hang out together, but you'll be right there to help your child facilitate language through the process. So if your child is shy and doesn't want to engage with the other child, you'll be right there to help your child maybe share their toys with the new child. So for example, if your child has a baby doll or a couple baby dolls that she likes and you want to play baby dolls together with the girls, you invite the other child over just to play baby dolls for an hour and a half. And you might have a snack in the middle of that and by the time you come in, say hello, look at where the baby dolls are, get them out, decide who's going to play with what baby doll, feed them a little, give them some food, make some play, dance with them a little bit, do some ba different baby doll play opportunities. So you have a little bit of a structure so we're here to kind of play babies and if that other child doesn't want to play babies, obviously the thing that you choose to play, you don't have to play babies. You can play whatever you want. But you play whatever your child is really into, whatever your child's superpower is. So if your child, if you've got a boy and they love to build, then you have a 
little building party. If they love to play cars, then you play with the train tables or the cars or, you know, whatever you play with. But invite somebody to come over to play with what your child likes to play. And while your child is playing with that, then you do the same kind of language facilitation that you do with your child when you play with them at home without the friend there. And what happens is your child will listen to you facilitating language and so will that other child. And that other child will talk a lot more when you facilitate language for both kids. That's what I used to do when I used to go to a family's house and they had a sibling. It didn't make sense for me if I showed up to be the speech lady and only worked with one child well and, and played toys and did puzzles and had some fun interactive time and then the other child had to be locked in the room no way that's no fun and it's not it's not realistic either so if you have more than one child you should be p practicing social play while you're doing language facilitation with all your kids together and this kind of interaction this is what's going to really help you watching you facilitate language with another child, listening to that other child listen to you facilitate language, your child's going to be listening to both of you. And they'll see how it goes to make this social communication a little bit easier. And then what happens is when your child then goes to school and they have the opportunity where they are at school playing together with the blocks, they will remember how you helped them facilitate through the sharing process, through the you get some of this and I get some of this. Um, and, and while that child is overplaying at your house, make sure you're modeling the language for how to talk about what the other child is doing. Look at that cool tower. Aubrey's building one and Jane's building another one. Aubrey's tower is tall and Jane's tower is short and Aubrey's tower looks like a castle and Jane's tower looks like another castle. I mean, you know, whatever you do to talk about it, talk about what both of the kids are doing, using your language facilitation, using your special careful kind of talking that is all about what your child loves to do. So if you invite someone else to your house to do an activity that your child loves to do, their superpower activity, and you just facilitate through that, it's gonna teach your child what to do at school. So it's good that you get notes from your child's school, from their daycare, from whoever. If they ever tell you, you know, X, Y, Z is a problem, and you wanna know what is the problem, you also wanna get more information from those um, teachers about the circumstance around where the problem happened so that at home you're able to recreate something kind of similar with a peer. So if your child doesn't like to share, you need to facilitate some sharing opportunities at home. If your child doesn't like to wait, like not like to wait in line, you have to facilitate some waiting experiences at home because and, and it might not happen in your house if you have an only child, but if you go out in the, in the world, you have to wait in line at the grocery store you have to wait all over the place talk through waiting with your child while you're with them doing your everyday activities so that they learn how to use those same strategies when they're at school having to wait and in places that they're outside of your control so I hope that was a good helpful answer for you Adriana about what's going on I see there's a bunch of people watching, but I haven't seen any new comments. So if you have, oops, sorry, itchy nose again, excuse me, everybody. Um, if you have a child who is a late talker and you've been using language facilitation, go ahead and share, you know, we've been doing it. Tell me about a strategy you've been doing because I know I'm doing these Q and A's and I know people are watching. So tell me about a strategy you've been using and what result you've had. So other parents can see what you've been doing. Is If somebody's watching this for the first time, they wanna see like, Who's actually trying this stuff? Who's actually doing things with their kids and seeing results? Other parents want to know if you're doing it. So help and share. So, and there's Angela. Hi, Angela. Angela's in my program. And Angela had a question I'm going to get to talk about. So Angela says it was very helpful. Well, here's a question from Carolyn first. Sorry, everybody. My nose itches. It's so rude. And I'm going to have a little drink of water. Excuse me. 
Okay, let's get to the next one. Carolyn. Carolyn says, hi. Hi, Carolyn. Thanks for joining me. I have to go to my son's basketball game and we'll watch later. Okay, so we'll give the answer the best we can. Want to ask real quick about my 11-year-old daughter. She loves the water. Any ideas would be appreciated. Also, she says things like curtains, which sounds like kittens. If I say, oh, she'll say, open the curtains. I know this is prompting. Should I stop or change that? Thanks so much. All right. Let's go. I'm going to dig through here a little bit. So Carolyn says, all right. She, she has an 11-year-old daughter who loves the water. Okay, so let's go there first. If your child loves the water and, you know, swimming is impossible every day, I would encourage some water play all the time, you know, as much as you can. You can do, um, you can do water play in the sink or bathtub, but structure it out like an activity, like a pretend play activity, and talk about what you're doing in the water. And my other favorite language facilitation strategy for lay talkers who love water is to have them help you do the dishes with you. Wash the dishes with actual soap. Even if you use the dishwasher um, a lot, have her wash the scrub the pots and pans or things like that. Because um, two things. Number one, it gives her a chance to play around in water and use it like a functional activity. It teaches her how to wash dishes, which is something that you actually do with water. Gives her an opportunity to play in it. And it also gives you, you know, when you're scrubbing on pots and pans and things, it gives you a chance to actually put some energy into it. A lot of kids love swimming because it works your whole body while you're playing in the water and that's why they love water. So that's the other thing you have to realize if your child loves water is what do they love about it? Do they love being in it? Do they love splashing it? Do they love having it on their head? Do they not like having it on their head? Whatever it is about that water, that's the kind of experience you want to emulate. Now, the other thing that you can do because it's not always practical to play with water because it's wet and there's things like, you know, phones and electronics and clothing and furniture and things like that and there's just not water available everywhere to have fun. So um, you can look, I just saw on YouTube this uh, past week, I have a family, a new family in my program who loves water and there are strategies on how to make those water bottles. So you take a two liter bottle and you put some um, liquid glycerin and water and glitter and you know little sparklies or shapes or plastic animals or whatever in there. The more glycerin you put in, the slower it moves. You can put food coloring in there and play with that because that can be something that could give a child interest in talking about water and movement. So the water bottle idea is a really good. So those are really good strategies because while your child's actually holding and looking at the water bottle, they're looking at that movement and feeling it. And you could be talking about the weather or school or whatever while you're your child is looking at that water flowing in sparkles in the water and it could help trigger some language. So water bottles in the, you know, the ones that you can make yourself, you can buy them too, but they're easy to make. Um, recycle stuff and uh, look for a YouTube video about that. I didn't make one, but I know other people did. So look for that. So those are some water strategies. And then of course, anytime you're out, you know, working with water, have her help you wash the car. Um, have her help you water the flowers or water the grass where you live um, in the summertime, you know, if water's available. So just spend a lot of time around water, but don't, it's not all about splash, splash, splash. It's the water. It's about being around water and talking about functional things with the water is what you want to do for language facilitation, especially with your 11 year old, because you don't have to have them wash even the, the china dishes, but scrubbing pots and pans and working with plastic things and how, what goes in the dishwasher and what doesn't go in the dishwasher. Those are amazing language facilitation opportunities. So that's the first thing. And then you're also saying that she says things like curtains, which sounds like kittens. Um, and I'm not sure if, I mean, obviously if she's saying a word and it's needs based, you know, like if she's saying curtains, that's a noun that she's saying to make something happen as a behavior. So like when I say curtains, you open the curtains or you do whatever. And if you say, oh, and she says curtains or open curtains, it is prompting and it is just getting her to say a behavior to open the curtains. If you want to teach her how to open 
open the curtains, you do this. You open the curtains and say, open, I'm opening the curtains. Look, they're open now and I can see outside. That's how you teach her the concept of open. And you never expect her to say it. You just do it a bunch of times. If it's something that she loves, opening this curtain, then you want to do it. Her speech will get better as she practices with it, but you can't work on speech articulation with a child that's just using needs-based words to communicate. It's way down the line. It's, you know, it's a waste of time actually, and it is really annoying for kids because kids don't use good articulation when they first start talking, especially if they're older and they're 11. They're in real strong habits about how they say words, how they talk, you know, using echolalia, how they, whatever they're using, they are firmly stuck in this is how I communicate. If you want to shift that to move over to getting more spontaneous verbal speech, it's a, this mind has to change this mind. You have to show your child. That's why every language facilitation strategy has to be fun. Because if it isn't fun, it isn't fun. And you're never going to change your mind if it's not fun. Like it's hard to change your mind even if it is fun. You know, you know if you decide you used to only take the bus and you never wanted to learn how to drive because you were scared of cars and you knew it would be easier to drive or vice versa. Maybe you've always driven and you don't like taking the bus, but you know it's better for the environment to take the bus, but you don't like being around people on the bus. You have to make some effort to get over and really make changes about that. You know it's a good idea to take the bus because it saves gas and it's cheaper and you save money or maybe your car is broken. And, and that's what usually happens is you're forced into doing something because something else breaks down. With language facilitation, your kids have worked really, really hard to get the, these habits going. If your child is limited verbal and 11 years old, that person, your child, has already trained you to know what they want or what's going on. Like I said, she says something that sounds like kittens and you know she's saying curtains. How did that happen? Well, she did it a lot of times and you're her mom and you watch her. So you know all the things about her emotional intelligence, her needs, her wants, her loves, all that stuff that you know that is survival mechanisms for you. And you need to make a shift into using brand new kind of communication, verbal speech. And what's good about it is most kids desperately want to talk, but it's the systems in their brain that between what worked to teach them the vocabulary that they know inside and the systems that are necessary for them to get the words out, those systems aren't communicating with each other very well. And you can train those systems to learn to communicate with each other better. And the thing that trains it, the only thing that trains it, is listening to other people talk. And it can't just be any kind of talking either. It can't just be haphazard, verbose, blah, 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 blah. Because what ends up happening is when the language comes at you too fast, you just, you, you, you get distracted and try to pick out words. So this talking that you're doing, if you're labeling and modeling language for your child to learn later and use later, use the, the words that they've memorized, it has to be slow. It has to be careful talking. It has to be short phrases. And it can't be just a single word over and over and over and over again because that's not how I talk. If I was doing this whole lecture here today, this whole Q&A session saying language facilitation and language facilitation and language facilitation and language facilitation and, and language facilitation. And, and language facilitation. I mean, there are different ways that I'm communicating. Language facilitation is important. Language facilitation is puzzling for people. Language facilitation is, you know, this is a Q&A session. All those emotions, that's how your child communicates with one word and their body. Cookie. 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 Cookie, cookie, cookie. It's one word. But all their body is communicating all the rest, all right? And so what language facilitation does, it takes all those emotions and gestures and all that other stuff I did in addition to saying the word and turning them into the language that all that stuff represents. So what do they mean when they say cookie versus they say cookie versus they say cookie versus they say cookie? 
you know cookie means I don't want a cookie or cookie means I ate too much and I can't have a cookie or cookie means oh, that's a great oh I want that right it means other stuff and your kids need to learn the words that go with all that other stuff because they know the word for cookie and if you're making them say cookie over and over and over again and they already know it they're gonna shut down it's not even learning it's just saying the stuff they already know right it's never, it's always like I say, it's like it, taking piano lessons and never playing a song. You just get to play the scales. You just get to play the scales. Oh, now we're going to do the C scale. No, 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 no. Now we're going to do the D scale. No, 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 no. Okay, time to go now. Wait, we don't get to play a song? We don't get to hang out and have conversation and, and talk about this? Or I don't get to play Beethoven? Or, no, no, no. Just play the song. That's what teaching your child to say words and prompting them does. So, you know, I know that I talk about you shouldn't prompt. It's not that you shouldn't. I mean, you can. You can continue to do. You. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I can never tell you what to do. You're you. But I am going to tell you that if you want conversational talking, then you have to demonstrate and model conversational talking. If you want single words, curtains, to say, open the curtains I want to see outside, then just keep responding to curtains by opening the curtains and not facilitating language because that's how you got to where you are now and that's the other thing that everybody watching this needs to understand questions or not if you want to see something different if your child's two or if your child's eleven if you want to see something different in their communication then you have to model different communication for them because they are talking they're imitating what they hear you saying and if you're saying old mcdonald had a the cow says, oh, for open, if you're prompting and you're expecting a word to come out, if you're expecting anything, then you're prompting, even if you don't think you're doing it. But if you have an expectation in your head of the right words that are going to come out of your child, oh, they said the right word, oh, they said yes, then that's not language facilitation. That's pulling words, that's prompting words out of your child. It's different. Language facilitation is just talking in a way that your child is paying attention to. That's why you have to talk about the things they love. Talk about the things they love to do and they will look at you. And when they look at you and listen to you and you talk with careful talking, they will learn language as long as you practice it. But you block all of that learning because you might do a lot of that. And if you do, bravo, keep doing it. But if you are also prompting, it's negating this. It's negating this because the prompting always overtakes the language facilitation because prompting always works. Do you want the cookie? Say a cookie. Well, yeah, I want the cookie. If that's what I got to do it, I'll do the behavior. But it literally lights up a different part of the brain. It's not the language part. It's the gimme part that's lighting up. And that works, but it's not talking. So that's what you got to do. All right. So Carolyn says she wants the curtains open. So she's saying curtains. Then you have to show her, oh, if you want the curtains open, you have to open the curtains. Look, I'm opening it. You talk about while you're doing it so that later she goes, oh, there has to be a word. Because if you're only saying curtains and she's only saying curtains, that's a noun. That's not even what do you do with the curtains? That's not a phrase. Remember, if you say only one word, how am I going to know what cookie means? If I only say cookie with a facial expression, but if I say cookie, then, it, then if, if then what you should be saying is cookie, please. If I'm saying cookie, then you should be saying no, thank you, cookie, right? Because that cookie means more than just that round thing that I want to eat, you know? It means I don't want it, or I do want it, or it is yummy, or it's mine, or it's yours, or it's not mine, or I lost it, or I want another one. Where, where does all that language come from when you're just saying cookie? Your child needs to hear all that other language in order to learn it. And if you continue to teach your child to say phrases, I want, it's that, hello, I feel happy, yada, 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 you just teach them these phrases that they memorize, counting one to a hundred, whatever they do, fill in the blank, then that's all they will learn. At what point will you move into conversational teaching, right? At what point do you ever move there if you're just teaching more and more vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary? And your child is learning the vocabulary. They're memorizing it. They probably have a memory like a steel trap. They probably have so much vocabulary in there, they don't even know what to do with it. In fact, that's why they're frustrated. 
That's why they're using their body. They have so much vocabulary in there, but they don't know what to do with it. Because you've just taught them words. You haven't taught them how to use them in functional situations. And that's what language facilitation doesn't happen at the kitchen table unless what you're doing at the kitchen table is what you're talking about. Eating, drawing, playing with Play-Doh. You got to be talking about that, or you got to be talking about what you did, um, you know, walking in the park while you're eating dinner. That's how language works. But if you talk about flashcards about zoo animals and you, you learn all the names of the zoo animals or you read, you know, it, it's, it's not even as good as reading a book about zoo animals because at least if you read a book about zoo animals, you tell a story or you learn about them. Otherwise, you're just saying a word. You're just imitating a word. You're just playing the scales. You're not playing the song. Language facilitation requires you to do that. That's how your kids learn it. So, Carolyn says, this makes so much sense. You are wonderful. Aw, thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you for watching. Can't wait to dive into this more. Carolyn, there is a link in the description of this video to the free class on my website. If this is the first time you're watching my video and you haven't seen my free class, you definitely should do that. All it requires of you to do is opt in with an email and you will learn about what language facilitation is, what blocks kids from talking, and why parents are the best language facilitators. You'll also learn how to move forward and learn more about working with me in waves of communication. And um, you'll also get an email every time I go live. So every time I do a topic conversation, uh, interview, anything like that, you'll get an email whenever I go live to let you know that you can always opt out of. But that's just something for you. It's my mission to help as many parents as possible. And I know that there's parents who can't afford my programs. I know there's parents who don't even know what my programs are, what I even do with people. And that's why I do these Q&As so that you can see how the strategies that I'm talking about here you know, in your process of language facilitation, if you have a late talking child and you want to get them talking, the first thing you have to do is figure out why they're not talking, right? Even as a speech pathologist, they have to do some kind of an evaluation. And usually those evaluations, they just tell you how much a child's talking or what kind of talking they're doing or what kind of talking they're not doing, right? But they don't tell you why. They don't tell you why a child is resisting you when you try to bring the puzzle to go talk to them or you want to play, uh, read a book and they're vo avoiding you. You know, you need to you need to learn about what is it that's causing your child to not want to listen to you talking, because if they're nonverbal and you're prompting, they're not talking because they're not listening. They're not talking because they're not listening. They're avoiding listening to you because you're not, you're talking in a way or you're saying words or whatever that they don't want to hear or that they can't listen to, that they can't attend to or whatever. That's what's going on. Something is blocking your child from being able to learn words from you. And even if your child has a neurological condition, uh, illness, uh, you know, whatever's going on in their body, that's going to block them from being able to listen to you and learn from you. But brains are super smart and they know how to heal. And what I am finding is that parents, it doesn't matter what is causing the child to be late talking. If it's ear infections, if it's immune issues, if it's motor problems, like they you have problems with their limbs and their, their mouth isn't working, that a true apraxia kind of diagnosis, all of those, it doesn't matter. All of those things, and it doesn't matter how old the child is either. So far in my pay, in my paid program, I have kids up till almost 10, from 2 till almost 10, and they all are making improvement no matter what's going on. Their parents are doing other things too sometimes. So sometimes they're doing stem cells, sometimes they're doing uh, biomedical, sometimes they're diet changes, sometimes they're do it depends on what's wrong with your child's physiology. So like if you are concerned that they might have toxicity from 
foods or additives or immunizations or whatever and you're detoxing your child all of that is important for their physical health because the physical health will block a child's interest and ability to listen to you. If you're not feeling well, you don't like to listen to people talk, especially if what they're saying to you isn't very fun to hear or easy to hear. So if it's a child with ear infections and they're hearing, they can't hear you talking, then they're not going to listen because it, it's hard to hear. So they're just gonna tune it out and start to use their vision. If your child has an autism diagnosis and they have other issues, because most kids with autism diagnosis, they have other issues um, th that parents are working on. Maybe they aren't well, maybe they have immune problems. You know, all those things that are going on and you're doing those other things, stem cells, whatever. There's a million different things out there, that, out there that are working and what the one thing that is consistent for every family, more than 70 families in my program, even with brain disorders, agenesis of the corpus callosum, really massive things, real observed on MRI disorders in the brain. They are teaching their kids to talk with language facilitation because language facilitation, the functional activity of listening to parents talk during functional activities while you're getting dressed, while you're playing toys, while you're riding in the car, those things, this is what it takes to activate the midbrain, the deep, deep part of the brain that isn't being addressed, that might be addressed by stem cells, that might be addressed by, you know, inside out kind of healing things. But the problem is not with the health of those cells. It might be, but just getting those cells healthy and the brain working better isn't going to do the whole job because language learning is a complex process. And just fixing the health of this brain, the one that's inside your skull, is only one part. Even this body is only one part. In fact, they're learning on MRI that the part of the brain that triggers the connection between the vocabulary that you know and the way for us to use it is centered around the area of the brain that has to do with the reinforcement and enjoyment of life. That's why prompting works. Because if a child's motivated enough, their mouth is going to say a word. Because that's how it goes in the process. And so what language facilitation does is it gets kids motivated to share their ideas with words, the ideas that are inside, the ideas that they're passionate about. Right? Because if they're passionate enough to really want to get that cookie to say cookie, they're going to be passionate enough to about share their ideas about how unhappy or happy they are about something. And that's why language facilitation works. And that's why language facilitation is necessary even if you are doing whatever else whatever else, to, phys to heal your child's body. And then the other thing that happens is this mind, the idea of talking is too hard for me because my body was broken, right? So even if your child's body was broken and you're fixing it with biomedical stuff, their mindset is, I can't talk. My brain doesn't work. My mouth doesn't work. It's broken. I have to use this other way to talk. And you know that's not true because now their body's healing. But they're in the mindset of talking is hard and I don't want to try it. And so they don't even want to try talking. And so you try to force the issue by pulling words out. And then the enjoyment of it goes away and the process breaks down. And that's what's happening. And they're proving it. They're looking at the difference. They've looked at the difference on MRI between this naming and labeling and saying things over and over and over again. And, you know, a lot of people thought if you do the same thing over and over and over again, you'll retrain your brain. You'll retrain your brain how to do it. But that's not how your brain learns. It trains your brain to follow directions, but it doesn't train your brain to learn, to use on their own. And the only way to share your own ideas, the, thing, the words that nobody expects you to say, is that you have that other part, the the intrinsic learning going on and that's how you do it with language facilitation so Angina says very true now Angina had a question for me about having trouble with food time 
So I know that Angela's boy already has some trouble with his mouth. He doesn't like to chew food. He swallows food whole. Um, and she's having trouble with it because he likes to play around and it takes him 45 minutes to eat and she needs help. So here's the thing. Um, the first thing is it all depends on what is that what is he doing when he's playing around is he playing why is he playing around it always comes down whenever I have somebody who set, gives me a, a a thing they need help with a problem they need to solve I understand why is the problem happening so why is he playing around while he's eating is he doing that because he doesn't want to eat the food because he's not and and if he doesn't want to eat the food why doesn't he want to eat the food does he not want to eat it because he's not hungry does he not want to eat it because he doesn't like it because the only reason a child wouldn't eat food that's in front of them is because either they don't like it or they're not hungry so that could be the first thing you need to think about if your child's playing around instead of eating maybe they don't want to eat and if it isn't fun it isn't fun and if they don't want to eat it they're not gonna so it might not be a problem if that's the situation. Um, the other thing is your child doesn't like to eat food, but they need to eat food because they have to get nutrition and that kind of stuff. Once again, if your child's not eating, then they want, then they're not hungry enough. So um, I would suggest as far as, I mean, this is a behavior thing about, you know, feed your child when they're hungry. And what I would do is if you don't want the meal time to extend 45 minutes, then you need to structure it ahead of time and you need to let him know that you have expectations because this is behavior expectations just like people who expect kids to say words if you expect your child to sit at the table to eat then you have to let them know here is your food I expect you to sit and eat right now and if they start to play around and not eat I would take the food away and say you're not wanting to eat now you don't want to eat because he is communicating non-verbally by playing around and not eating the food that he doesn't want to eat it so you have to say, you have to model the language for that and say, you don't want to eat now. I'm going to take this food away and then see what his reaction is. If he truly is hungry, then you need to talk through that activity and say, if you are hungry and it's time to eat food, now is the time to eat. Because he might not understand that you, do, you don't have 45 minutes for this meal. You know, he doesn't see that it's a problem to spend 45 minutes to get through a meal. Some people do take 45 minutes to get through a meal. If you want the meal time to be shorter, you have to structure it that way. Otherwise, he can't understand and he doesn't know. And that's what kids want to do is they just want to understand. And I know your boy would follow the rules if he could, if he understood them. So that's the other thing that's going on is your child isn't understanding understanding what your expectations are otherwise they would follow them because most of the time kids aren't being naughty they're not intentionally refusing to do what you want they either don't like it or they think it's too hard and so if they think it's too hard you have to help them with it and if they don't like it you have to make it more fun and that's how you make it happen because if it isn't fun it isn't fun and if it's not your child's idea they're not gonna learn to do it themselves they're only gonna do it just to make you happy which many kids will do and that's great but again you just have to look at it for what it is so the most important lesson about all of that is that you should just pay attention to what you're teaching and what you're expecting of your child and if it's something reasonable go for it. If not so much, then, you know, move on. It's not that big of a problem anyway. Some problems you just don't need to have. Pick your battles. Okay, everybody. I think that's it for today's live q and I'm going to jump off of here for now. Thanks so much for joining me. If I was able to help you on this video, even if you're watching on the replay, give me a thumbs up. Please share with your friends if these ideas were helpful for you. And um, you can remind your friends too and yourself that every Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, I will be right here on my Waves of Communication page doing live Q&A. So in the meantime, I'll be doing other videos with education and strategies for language facilitation. If you want to learn more, my free class is on my website and there are 200 videos on my YouTube channel with strategies you can dig through and use.
use and there's always a good time to start language facilitation you can do it right now you don't need to buy anything you don't need to do anything you just need to decide to be a language facilitator and um, allow the natural language to come out of your child naturally and that's how you do it with language facilitation all right everybody thanks again for joining me and I'll see you all on my next video bye for now